wondered why people do what they do on a broader scale of understanding? Ever wondered what really causes them to take action? Ever found certain actions people once did rather unjustified? Have you been a victim to social peer pressure or anything of the similarity? What's the point of all these questions? Why for a goal, of course. Objective here today is to learn the concepts of social and cognitive psychology and what leads others to take certain actions and things. The difference between the two? Cognitive psychology is a scientific study of mind and mental function, including learning, memory, attention, perception, reasoning, etc. Social psychology is the study of social behavior, especially of the reciprocal influence of the individual and the group with which the individual interacts. Psychology as a whole is the broad study of the brain and what basically causes all these sorts of functions. For these two specific branches, however, it alone has to do with social interactions and what it gives off at the same time. Many of these emotions can defer. However, some of these emotions can indeed lead people to do very drastic measures. Columbine is an infamous example of this. And a majority of the time, people lead themselves to a wrong state of morale as well, such as Nero. However, there are also plenty of incidents in which people have done good deeds as well. Basically, as a whole, these two branches of psychology have to do with what people themselves think is right or what is wrong, and everyone's thoughts are exactly different. Yet, there are also plenty of incidents in which people have similar mindsets, and this is what causes friendships in the first place. First topic of interest. Results of the actions that go on inside the human mind, and what causes them to do a certain action in the first place. Things to look out for. Influence upon others can determine a person's decision. To start, several parts of a person's decision in any social situation has to do with group influence. Their influence can be brought on by persuasion, obedience, or sometimes through the process of group thinking which is basically a type of thinking that occurs when people place more importance on maintaining group cohesiveness than solving the problem the group has in the first place. Some people can be more attached than others in terms of dedication and even obedience, and this has to do with a concept experts use known as the three aspects of attitude. These aspects include emotional attitude, cognitive attitude, and behavioral attitude. Things to look out for. The three branches of the structure of attitude. Attitude in general is a temporary organization of beliefs, feelings, and sort of tendencies towards groups, events, or situations. The emotional branch of attitude involves an individual's feelings and emotions towards an object or aspect, such as being afraid of clowns or snakes. To continue, the behavioral branch of attitude, aka cognitive, has to do with the way the attitude we have influences how we act or behave. An example being, I will avoid clowns and scream and run away if I see them, especially snakes. The final branch of the structure of attitude is the cognitive component, which involves a person's belief or knowledge towards a specific object they show attitude with. An example here can be that I believe all clowns are serial killers and all snakes are very dangerous. These three parts of a person's attitude all correlate with each other as they work in a mental cycle in your head and these three are especially used in terms of groups or any other sort of social or mental interaction. Example 1. An individual is at an amusement park with friends, but a disagreement occurs when everyone but the one individual wants to go on a roller coaster. Reason why he does not want to go on? The emotional branch gives off that he fears roller coasters. The behavioral branch shows that he averts from roller coasters and walks away from the entrance. The cognitive branch tells everyone that he feels roller coasters to be unsafe and can cause death. Example 2. An individual is in major need of a restroom, but he is miles from home and the only option is a public restroom at a park. His emotional attitude feels he's grossed out by public restrooms. The behavioral attitude shows a sickening feeling in his stomach at the sight of a public restroom. The cognitive attitude exposes that he thinks public restrooms are contagious and carry thousands of different diseases. Overall, all these parts of social psychology cause people to think what they think and do what they do. 
as they muster a variety of emotions and feelings, creating attitudes which, in general, create decisions. There are also cases of individuals having sorts of beliefs or theories in clubs or religions that can compromise their decisions and give them certain limits to actions. Things to look out for. Reasonable mind, emotional mind, and wise mind. Basically, along with attitude, the mind as well has parts and sections in which the process of social psychology takes place. This includes the three branches of the mind states. Reasonable mind, a state in which people approach things intellectually, using logistics, plans, pay attention, and especially learn. Examples, googling up specific recipes instead of going to a grocery store without a plan, asking a sales clerk about details on something you want to buy, or something basic like studying for a test. Emotional mind, a state in which a person's thinking and behavior are controlled mostly by their own emotions. Using logistics is difficult, and energy of the specific behavior tends to match the intensity of feelings. Examples, debating an individual you aren't in agreement with, petting an animal, buying something really expensive just because you like it, disregarding the cost alone, and many more. Wise mind. This is the unity of both sides of the mind and occurs when both reasonable mind and emotional mind are in balance. New emotion added is intuition, which is the balanced sense of what is right and what is wrong. The majority of the day, people are in this specific mindset. Examples include promoting of calmness to see things as they really are true, identifying the best solution to a sort of problem, or identifying the skills and strategies needed to solve a problem using both sides of the mind. Also, notice how on um, both emotional and reasonable mind states have to do with the classic left brain and right brain theory. Emotional has to do with the right brain on factors like arts and affection. Reasonable has to do with the left brain on factors like mathematics and logistics. The states of the mind also correlate with attitude stages and even group influence among others. This all works in a very fast manner of decisions and actions, but it really occurs in any situation imaginable. Now. Let's go over social psychology's brother, cognitive psychology, and what it has to teach us. Second topic of interest, understand the process of attention, language use, memory, perception, thinking, etc. Things to look out for, human experimental psychology. The first piece to be aware of in cognitive psychology is the human experimental psychology branch, which is basically when psychologists make a methodological approach to conduct experiments to observe any specific human behavior. There is a particular relationship that human experimental psychology has with cognitive, as it is also a specific study of human responses, such as perception, motivation, memory, learning, and even physiological psychology. And basically, cognitive psychology, along with its counterpart, social psychology, also has its own separate branches, such as human experimental psychology, uh, computer analogies like information processing, and even cognitive neuroscience. Things to look out for. The human processes that go on throughout the day. The first process to understand is attention, which in the psychological definition is a state of focused awareness on a certain aspect of new or renewable information. The main reason for attention in the mind in the first place is to sort out between unnecessary information and to bring in desired data so it can be transferred to other mental processes. And this is where the idea process itself begins and where a person's ideas of action start. The next process is memory, and this is distinctive with two parts. There is short-term memory and long-term memory. Long-term memory is the brain system for preservation, managing, and gathering information. Short-term memory, aka working memory, is the shortened time that you keep a thought or idea in mind until you decide to either discard it or transfer it to long-term memory. To continue, the next human process is perception. Perception basically includes physical senses like sight, hearing, and taste, along with the knowledge of interpreting the senses. In other words, it allows people to understand things using physical senses but with cognizant idea. Another human process is language. And this is probably the most complex to understand out of the others. To simply put it, much of this process has to do with the acquisition of the language and even how and why a language is involved in specific moves. Let's put these processes into whole examples. Example 1. 
Someone is at a restaurant trying to decide what to order. The retention process shows that they are acknowledging the choices in the menu and bringing in the ideas of what they may want. The memory process gives off that the individual remembers that they, what they ordered last time and really enjoyed, which is long term, and remembers the name of the waiter, which is short term. Perception reminds them the sight or what the food looked like and the taste of the food. Finally, language shows that the person is fluent in French and the restaurant is French, so they feel it would be okay and necessary to use it. Example 2. Someone is trying to configure the notes to playing a certain song on a ukulele. The attention process leads them to understanding the instrument and how to properly play it and hold it. The memory reminds them of the notes and chords needed, which is long term, and who the exact artist is, which is short term. Perception gives them the feeling of the ukulele and how to properly play the song, and their sight shows the strings and frets needed to play. Finally, language process lets them sing along in the tropical language the song is being played in, which enforces the tropical sound. Now, after all of this, you're probably wondering what social psychology and cognitive have in common. But wonder no more. Third topic of interest. The similarities and connections social and cognitive psychology share and further understand them both. Cognitive psychology alone studies the human's thought and idea processes, and the similarity is that the entire process is included in social interactions, which is what social psychology teaches. We can also compare the ideas of the three parts of attitude, emotional, behavioral, and cognitive, so the three states of the mind, reasonable, emotional, and wise, and the human processes. These can all be noted for working in a specific cycle in the mind to finalize the certain results, actions, decisions, etc. that we make throughout the day as stated before. That itself overall sums up the concepts of social and cognitive psychology, and there are still so many mysteries left about the brain since we can only use such a small percentage. Now ask yourself some questions. What more discoveries lie inside our brain? How will we discover the potential of the rest of the brain, and how will we be able to use the remaining percent? Can we ever further understand social interactions and human processes at an even greater scale of knowledge beyond this video?